Uh, no mai hare mai. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for um, joining us for this uh, roundtable discussion on the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, so my name is Kim Ibera Lozier. Um, I'm a senior lecturer and academic lead for the University of Waikato, uh, based at the Adams Center. And I'm Martin Bevan, uh, also based here in the yeah, sunny uh, Tauranga Moana. Um, yeah, we've got a great uh, bunch of people today. We're really excited to uh, introduce to you and they're going to have a chat about their experiences at the uh, Tokyo Olympics. We've got um, people in lockdown up there. Uh, thanks, uh, Stephen, for coming along there. I think you're in the garage, aren't you? And uh, yeah, a few of us here in, uh, at the Adams Centre, the uh, University of Waikato Adams Centre here in, in um, Mount Monganui. And uh, yeah, Brett Smith joining us nice and early. Thanks heaps for um, getting up, Brett. And uh, yeah, one of these things is not like the other, I think you could sort of say here. Um, thanks heaps for joining us, Brett. Uh, um, yeah, so we'll get into it. Yeah, so um, we just thought that we'd start with, a, you know, let the speakers introduce, um, introduce themselves. Um, so you know a little bit more who they are. So uh, Brett, if you want to, yeah, introduce yourself and, and what your role at the Olympics was this year. Yeah, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Brett Smith, uh, Nati Rakai Paka, Nati Kangununu. Um, yeah, um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato, uh, part time at the moment. I do consultancy work uh, primarily in the rugby uh, all around the world. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in rowing, and I was with the Australian rowing team at this Olympics, although I also had worked with New Zealand Sevens for the last three years as well. So that's me. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, Steve. Yeah, hi, thanks for the <coughs> intro, um, Kevin, Marty. Uh, good to see you guys. Yeah, I'm stuck in a garage here in Auckland at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, I'm currently uh, a performance physiologist for high performance sport, um, uh, working up in Auckland. And um, my main role for the Olympics was to uh, sort of develop and implement heat management strategies across a lot of teams and athletes uh, in the system. And yeah, as as Brett as well, I've done a little bit of work with the Sevens um, guys uh, across the last few years as part of my PhD when I was um, over there at the Adams Center for high performance from, I've been, I was there since 2018 to uh, end of 2020. Um, yeah, that's a brief intro for me. Cool, thanks, Steve. Uh, Connor. Yep. Hey, everyone. My name is Connor McNeil. I am the head strength and conditioning coach for the All Black Sevens. Uh, my role during the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games is just to kind of coordinate a bit of the heat response stuff from Stephen, and as well as work um, with Brett around some of our kind of load management, and then just make sure our players are in peak kind of physical condition um, during the Olympic Games. So making sure they're at their best when they need to perform at their best. And um, I'm also a PhD student with the University of Waikato, based here in the Mount, Mount Monganui, um, where I study a bit of strength and power research that I've been able to apply and use with some of our athletes. Brilliant. Thanks, Connor. Uh, last but certainly not least, Brad. Good afternoon, Brad. Um, as uh, everyone has done, just introduce himself. My name is Bradley Anderson. I'm a strength and conditioning coach for our uh, Black Men and Sevens uh, women's side. I try to do everything that Connor does, just on a uh, lesser level, probably. Um, have been with the team for, for five years now and um, been lucky enough to, to work alongside Brett, Stephen, and Connor in the last few while and learned a lot from these lads. So, looking forward to today's chat. Great, brilliant. Thanks, guys. So yeah, it'd be great if you could just uh, give us a little bit of a chat about your journey and, and the pathway that brought you to be uh, where you are now and, and how you got to be at the Olympics and, and um, yeah, have that fantastic uh, experience. So you can just yeah, tell us a little bit about your, your journey, Connor. Yeah, so if you can tell from my accent, I'm from the US originally, um, grew up in the Seattle area, and I've kind of taken a different path than maybe a lot of other people just because of my international kind of background. So um, I've been with the Sevens organization for about a total of two years now. I've started as the development SNC for the All Black Sevens before coming on as a strength and conditioning coach um, across both programs. So assisting Brad and assisting uh, the men's program as well before stepping into the head strength and conditioning role um, kind of in a 
uh, immediate lead up to the games. Um, but as a strength and conditioning coach, uh, this profession has kind of brought me all around the world. So like I said, started out in the US um, where I lived in five different states, working with a range of athletes from young development um, all the way up to professional and some of the US Olympic Committee athletes as well. And so just got a taste for such the, the kind of wide world that sport is. Um, and that led me to different places. So worked in Nice, France briefly, um, as well as Tianjin, China, before having a cup of coffee with the head trainer for the All Blacks uh, when they were crushing Team USA in an international test match. Um, so that cup of coffee led me down to New Zealand, where I started a PhD in 2018, around the same time as Stephen did. Um, and some of my research played directly into some of the work that I now do uh, with the All Black Seven. So um, kind of a winding path for me, but um, it's always been a dream to go to the Olympics and Tokyo was amazing in that respect. So um, again, kind of a, a different journey maybe, but it's been quite a ride. That was a thrill of a lifetime being able to go. It must to have been a good cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what was your educational pathway? So what did you study at university? Yeah, so um, with the way that the kind of higher education system works in the U.S., spent two years, my first two years of uni um, doing general studies. So I kind of had some interest in sport, had kind of had some interest in business um, before I got into a, a, a random sports psychology class, actually, that kind of sparked my interest. And once I had a taste of that, I knew that this was going to be my pathway. It's just kind of this passion. I, I, I had always played sports, so I played American football at the university level and was a hammer and shot put thrower for the athletics team as well. So I kind of been um, immersed in that process like as an athlete and then um, through some of my studies was able to kind of turn that passion into more of a skill set um, and then pursue that. So my undergraduate work led to a master's in health and human performance and then that led to the PhD here in New Zealand. Cool, thanks for that, Connor. Uh, Brad, would you like to carry on? Yeah, um, my journey, I suppose, started way back. This is, I don't, I don't even know, Connor and Stephen were probably still at primary school when I was at university. Um, and uh, I was in year two of a, of a three-year degree, which probably ended up being a five-year degree. But John Cronin, a uh, mentor of ours, came into our class and said there was an opportunity as a uh, as an intern with the Blues rugby franchise at the time. And um, I was a leaguey growing up, so wasn't, you know, wasn't really following rugby at the time, but uh, an opportunity came up, interviewed, got the internship, spent 12 months with the Blues, and then was lucky enough to follow that internship into Auckland rugby, where I spent another 12 months uh, working alongside Blair Mills. And then uh, that sort of led to an opportunity with Northland rugby, where I was uh, the academy SNC. And long story short, a mentor took left there. So he put me in the hot seat as head SNC for Northland Rugby. So I spent four years in total um, sitting with the Tanifa and then moved down to Auckland Rugby where I yeah, played multiple hats over the course of about six years where it was women's sevens, women's fifteens, uh, international academy, kids from Japan, Argentina, uh, Europe, the States would come across, would essentially smash them really, not really make them better at rugby, just give them a hiding and send them back. And uh, that led to a head of SNC role with Auckland Rugby for two seasons, I think. And then the opportunity with the women's seven sort of come up um, and probably not feeling confident in my own abilities to, to actually execute the role. I still put my name in the hat and um, was lucky enough to be given the role and, and sit down with Vance and get to work alongside him and Corey and, and Stu. And then obviously you, know, you meet the, the likes of Steve and Brent and Connor and, you, you realize how little you actually know. So it's been a, it's been an unreal ride um, probably over the course of the last 13 years. And growing up, I'm, I'm unsure now when I look back at, at my childhood, my upbringing, and not that it was rough or anything, but just you know, all the opportunities that I've been given over the, over the last five years, I never would have dreamt as a kid that you know, I would have traveled around the globe the way we have to, to follow a game of, of sevens rugby, essentially. So it's been awesome. That's why it's so interesting to hear people's stories and journeys because, yeah, there isn't really a one right path to take, is there? And sometimes it's just about taking that leap and, and yep. uh, having a bit of faith and the people around you, you know, you, uh, the mentors and the people that help you out along the way. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, when I was at uni, um, back in those days, everyone had a, a certificate, a diploma, 
and only the top level students had a degree. Um, and, and so I chased the degree, but now obviously a degree is just your entry level into what you see now with Connor and Stephen doing the masters and then going on to PhD and any students watching, you know, I, I can't recommend that enough. Everyone, you know, obviously industry experience is huge, but being an expert in an area is definitely gonna put you ahead of other candidates that are, you know, that are, that are going for roles similar to yourself. So get it done. Thanks, we'll move on to you there, Stephen. Just unmute myself. Um, yeah, so I guess a, a similar line is um, like you were saying, it, it had a different pathway. I guess like you're saying, there's no real one way to, you know, um, to, to be in the industry. So I, I'm from, I did my university in Dunedin. I, I did it a bachelor's of applied science and sport and exercise nutrition. Um, and when I started that, my, my goal was I wanted to be a, a sports dietitian. Was that, that was kind of why I started university and I was really passionate about that kind of side of things and sort of metabolism and things. And so I did that and then I got to the end of it and I started doing dietetics and I didn't like it because <laughs> it was really clinical. Um, and I could just see myself ending up in a hospital um, working, feeding people through tubes and stuff. So I, um, I decided to switch over to the, the PE school down there and um, I had some really good mentors there, of, uh, Nancy Reher and um, Jim Cotter and exercise physiology and metabolism. Um, and I did my master's through that program. It was in um, energy, like energetics of sedentary behavior. So it had still kind of limited functionality in terms of sport, but it was, it was around en energetics, but at doing that, you kind of learn along the way what, what you're like and what you're passionate about. And I was playing quite a lot of rugby at the time and, you know, really into sport. So I always knew I was into rugby and into sport and into, into the science around in the background of it. So anyway, I finished my master's there and had a couple of years off um, being a tour guide, actually cruising around the South Island. Um, doing tramping trips with American tourists and during that time I just keep my eye out for things to pop up and um, it was lucky enough that the stars aligned for me for a scholarship at the University of Waikato Adam Centre to work with the Sevens program. Um, uh, it was so it was University of Waikato High Performance Sport and uh, New Zealand rugby um, and so when I saw that I was like well this is exactly what I want to do and so I did that and it was just to, to develop and sort of help them out with a bit of heat acclimation and cooling strategy stuff um, for the Olympic campaign uh, so I applied for that and I was fortunate enough to get it and um, spent a couple years there and that was awesome like getting to know Brad and Connor and um, the whole the whole group of coaches and staff and it was like I suppose it was my first real um, deep dive into professional sport um, when I turned up. So it was pretty raw, but I learned a heap just by being in the environment, like Brad says, um, just being around uh, people and getting to know the systems and things. And you could learn a lot just by being sort of immersed uh, in, in a professional environment. Um, so yeah, I did that and um, then through my relationship with high performance sport, uh, the, the the person that was doing my role at the moment went on maternity leave. So um, again, I guess the stars aligned a little bit for me to get into this Tokyo role. So in, in Tokyo, I was, um, we had a prep and recovery team. So I was, they sent a physiologist, a strength and conditioning coach and a nutritionist. So I was the physiologist as part of that group. and um, was sort of in charge of the recovery area so it, it lent well to the skills I'd learned across the time with sevens with um, recovery and um, cooling management and things like that so yeah that was sort of how I got there I suppose um, it's been a great journey and I'll be really grateful for the time with um, the sevens group across in the mount there and and that and what I learned through that process Right, thanks, Stephen. And we'll, um, yeah, we'll move on to uh, Brett. So, obviously, uh, 
been on the waka there and across the jump the ditch but uh yeah can you get to tell us a little bit about your uh journey brett and, and how you came to be at the tokyo olympics yeah um again it's good to hear everyone's uh different journeys uh my journey was pretty different uh school didn't go too well <laughs> and so i was heading into the army and uh went up to burnham and one of the officers there took a bit of interest and said, uh, why don't you tie officer training in Duntroon? You've done reasonably well at school, which is sort of the first time anyone had talked about anything like that. So I had to do a year of university to get into officer training. So I uh, went into university with the goal of um, officer training, actually in Duntroon, which is just down the road from where I am at the moment here in Canberra, and uh, never left university, basically. <laughs> Um, I was, was interested in sport. Um, I still can't, I didn't apply for physical education, um, but, but for some reason I ended up there and I'm still not sure how, to be honest. I got a letter, a random letter from some of the Z school offering me a place there. Um, I've done reasonably well in sports. So I guess that's how it happened because I never applied. And so I did phys ed degree and, um, yeah, um, and then went on and did a master's and I did my master's with rowing and uh, the head coach for New Zealand rowing heard about it. And so he invited me. Um, I actually had moved to University of Canterbury and was working there, invited me to Waikato University. Um, I started working with uh, New Zealand rowing in, for the Atlanta Olympics, preparing for the Atlanta Olympics. Uh, heat preparation there with a, a great man who's unfortunately dead now, Gordon Sleeve, it was a great uh, mentor. Uh, Alan Hahn, who was the head of the Australian Institute of Sport, mentored me a little bit through that period of time as well. And that sort of started the journey. Um, so I was an academic who worked uh, with New Zealand rowing for quite a while. Um, again, managed to be really fortunate that uh, a guy called Dick Tonks um, took over the program in 2000 and him and I just had a pretty amazing relationship. He's the ultimate artist and I try to use Scientific principles, uh, I had a very good uh, master's and PhD supervisor in Will Hopkins, so he sort of really made me think about the world as an experiment, for want of better terms. So Tonks, the artist, and I, the scientist, and that was just the most amazing journey. I think when we started, we were 35th in the world, and, you know, when I finished, we were in the top three for the last six years. So, you know, I was, I was going... Um, to world championships and, and getting absolutely last to to the last period of times we're going to the Olympics games and, and doing really well. Um, I had to make a decision to go full time with New Zealand rowing or back to academia or well, Waikato University. Uh, Waikato University pitched me a good good option, so I, I dropped out of sport, went to Waikato University. Um, the Chiefs basically knocked on the door and said, hey, we hear you're not with rowing anymore, you're interested in rugby. So I got involved with rugby um, and some most amazing coaches, Dave Rennie, Wayne Smith, Tom Coventry and Andrew Strawbridge. And I've continued friendship with them all the way through. Um, so I, I mean, Wayne Smith walks all around the world. So wherever he goes, I go with him. Uh, so we've worked in the USA, uh, Europe, uh, Japan. Um, yeah, so I switched from rowing to uh, rugby. Um, some of the coaches that I've worked with in rowing have asked me to come back and do little roles of them. So I was with the Swiss team uh, for the Rio Olympics, as well as being with the Chiefs, uh, with the Blues at the moment. Um, Blair Mills and Brad uh, made contact with me about working with the Sevens. So I, I, I worked with the Sevens. So it's been a, it's a long journey. I'm probably a bit older than everyone else. Um, it's again, Stephen made this uh, statement about the stars aligning. Well, I, I never planned this. This is all all accidental. You know, even even the, the leaving rowing and getting to rugby. I mean, that was basically cold call. Tom Coventry rang me, Phil Healy rang me, and then went there and Wayne Smith got hold and touched with me. And yeah, and, and the sevens as well, too. I mean, that was pretty much cold calling. So um, I'd like to tell young people that you should plan and <laughs> do things because these things open up but like I said you know I was told in school that uh, I'd never go to university because it wasn't clever enough and all that sort of stuff uh, so the army or driving a truck was my options 
and now I've got a PhD, master's, uh, undergrad with a double major, um, other qualifications as well too, been to multiple Olympics, multiple world championships. Um, yeah, you know, you got to pick the people you listen to, I think that would be my message. Cool. Thanks, Brett. Oh, that was really interesting to hear everybody's different stories. It's uh, yeah, amazing how people can get to similar places, but, you know, widely different, different paths. So, um, so now we'd just like to move on about your actual Tokyo, you know, Tokyo experience. Um, so if you could just describe to us, um, you know, obviously going to the Olympics is really just a select few that, um, you know, manage to experience, you know, the, the Olympics. Um, so we just be really keen to hear about your experience and what your, you know, your most memorable moment um, of the Tokyo Olympics was for you. Um, so Brad, we might just start with, with you for this one. Yeah, can I, can I just quickly touch on like all, all our speakers, so Connor, Stephen and Brett have all said the start of the line to get them into these positions, but, but for any, any of them listening, like Connor, Stephen and Brett are extremely good at what they do. Um, and, and that is, and, that is that is front of mind for me, and and at the same time, they're all good humans. So, you know, it's all it's all good. You students being at uni and and, and getting your PhDs and masters and all that. But if you're a deck, um, you're probably not going to you're probably not going to get to where these this crew is sitting. So just have that in the back of your mind. No, learn as much as you can, um, but then also to learn to learn how to talk to other humans because that's a that's a big part of why these guys sit in their chairs. Um, and they and they turn and they turn up. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And day in, day out. And I've gotten emails from Brett at like two in the morning, emails from Connor at like 5 a.m. in the morning. Stephen probably about lunchtime when he wakes up, but everyone, everyone else, like these guys are hard workers. And, and you know, for anyone watching, that, that's, that's going to underpin anything you do. And that, that'll, employers will look at that irrespective of, of how high your qualifications are. So, Get the calls. Talk that's, 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 that's they talk about some of those attributes, don't they? That uh, require zero talent, and th and that's the yeah. You know. One hundred, one hundred percent. I just just wanted to put that out there to anyone that's that's listening. Right? These are smart dudes, but they front up, and and, and for us, I suppose, in, in rugby, that goes a long way. So, but I I think um, the Olympics, Sam is kind of like, I learned pretty quick that I was. Uh, poor athlete like had tried and tried and tried to be an athlete but that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna happen so I wanted to go to the Olympics bad um, and when this role came up um, it was it was sort of a no-brainer that I could potentially go to the Olympics in a, in a supporting staff capacity which which I was passionate about um, but the the Olympic Games itself on a on a professional level you think it's the pinnacle of all sport but for me it was it was a stress-free week once we landed in the village I, I had dreamt of being quite stressful and just the pinnacle of all sport and you get wound up and all that but because of the boys on this course so Stephen running the cooling area like he, he took things away from my role that could then just allow me to to oversee other areas and put all the pieces of the puzzle together so Brett handled my loading Stephen handled my recovery I lent on Connor for the gym and then it was my job just to just to keep things moving in the in the right direction. And because I had that that support from these lads on the call, the time there was it could allow me just to enjoy the the Olympics as a spectacle and almost you know nail my role, but but also just be a fan um, if that makes sense. So when I when I got to the village, the village was everything you could dream it as as a as a as a, as a again as a spectacle. You got the world's best athletes all in one place. So you had these massive 150 kg weightlifters. You, you know, you had these two foot tall gymnasts. You had seven foot basketballers, volleyballers, rowers, and it was just, it was just amazing to see, um, you know, when, when they're all in one place. How, I suppose, not how inadequate you feel as a human, but you, I was definitely felt like I was walking around the land of the giants. Um, but it was just, it was just an awesome experience, and because of. Uh, all the support I had, I could just enjoy the week. So for me, the Olympics was uh, was a great experience and, and probably allowed me to be to revisit my thinking and, and hopefully you know, and go to the France Olympics in 2024. So it's me. Oh, cool. Thanks, Brad. Um, Steve. Hey, thanks for your words, Brad. <laughs> no, no pressure. Cool, 
And um, yeah, um, the reason why it took me to lunch time to email you is because I was drinking that plunger coffee, and you guys, you know, as a student, like you were, it's just what you got to do. Whereas you know, you guys are out at your cafes drinking your long macchiatos and stuff. Um, that's probably another key to success, I think. It says having at least four or five coffees before midday. That's Brad's word, anyway. Um, so my my Tokyo experience. So I was in I was literally in the basement basically the whole time. I, I as part of the um, so I was a skeleton crew of the New Zealand Olympic team. So we turned up. It was like ten days before the Olympics started, and we set up. But that was actually real interesting just to turn up to the village when no one's there and you see the it's really raw like the it's basically not finished and um you know and you just set it up and make it look really good and put all your so we set up a gym we set up a recovery pools area uh, we set up a little kitchen nutrition spot and um i really enjoyed that experience because it's like those intangible things that you don't really go to university to learn but you just you know need to know how to do plumbing um build <laughs> um and you know do electrical work and stuff which i don't know how to do really but it, it was quite fun trying to figure it out uh, we only blew up one uh transformer and nearly had a massive fire and burnt the whole building down but that was all good um so that that was quite funny actually turning up and doing all that stuff. We, we prepared really well for it. We, we knew what we were getting into. We brought a lot of stuff over. We bought two shipping containers worth of kit. Um, so we had heaps of stuff and heaps of um, kind of contingency plans about things if things weren't going to work. And um, yeah, so that was interesting. And then during, once the athletes started to turn out, I, I really enjoyed the process of following through um, the athletes through their through their like pre-training week and then through their competition weeks like just i guess emotionally like it, i don't think i prepared myself for that side of thing like always being performance orientated and and all the detail you don't really i guess that was the the, the biggest thing i think i didn't prepare myself for in the games was um that kind of side of things it, it, and it was like it was really raw you know like down in a in the prep and recovery area, like people are coming for a cold pool or, or whatever before they're for pre-cooling and post-cooling. And that's kind of when it's really real for them, seeing like the rowers an hour and a half before their gold medal row or and then or straight after a row where they haven't done as they expected. And um and yeah, I think that was real really interesting side um of of the of the Olympics. Um probably be the thing that would stick with me the most along with it's interesting being on calls with um the new zealand olympic team and comparing the experience to the paralympic team it, it sounded like the the new zealand team at the olympics had a really good culture compared to the para team and, and the, like everyone was connected and we had a good kind of um team culture within teams and and i think that was really special in the way that we could celebrate people's success um, at the village, even though it was heavily restricted, we were still able to um, kind of hucker for people and, uh, and and do those little things that were really special. So yeah, I think that'll be those will be the things that I remember the most is that kind of uh, stuff alongside the actual competition. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you sort of talk about that and that sort of for Nangatanga that we sort of talk about those relationships and those um, connections. And I know that was a big part of the, the culture in the in the sevens setup as well, obviously. But just you talking about how the the athletes are real people, you know, they experience emotions and that you know they're not just these robots that you see on TV. Um, so yeah, forming those connections is obviously a, a, a massive part of what you guys do as well. Yeah. Super interesting. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, Brett, what was your experience? Oh, you're on mute, Brett. Yeah, yeah, mine was obviously uh, different. Uh, I've been part of the New Zealand Olympic um, program for many years um, and been involved with New Zealand teams. Uh, what was the difference? Um, the resourcing is massive in Australia 
and the expertise that you can you can uh, go to is is huge as well. Although in saying that, um, I spent a lot of time with Jim Cotter um, down at Targa University. He he'd helped me for uh, Athens and Beijing and, and and other other events. So I went back to him. But but that would be my biggest thing um, difference. I mean, we had to have a plan together in 2016 uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, and it and it had to be, you know, well considered because it got slammed by a lot of experts. And you know, uh, the difference for me was is that when I was talking about the environmental plan, I, I was talking to people who had who had planned for Atlanta and uh, Athens and Beijing and heavily resourced and things like that. So we had to have multiple plans in place and, it, and it, it took a lot of time to get those plans. And then 2017, we dry ran our plan. Uh, 2018, we adapted our plan. So as we headed to, um, to Tokyo, you know, we had an A and a B plan and then COVID obviously meant that we needed to have a C plan as well. But it was easy to generate the C plan because we had such a well-developed A and B plan. We just took elements of that. And I spoke to Jim again uh, caught it down at Tug University about that. And, and at the same time, I was involved in the Sevens program as well, too. Um, and through my connections with New Zealand Rowing, um, and, and there's great people. I mean, uh, in New Zealand Rowing, I, I got to know the two sports scientists, um, uh, Justin and Caroline, before and, and during the Olympics. And I mean, they're good people. But that would be the biggest difference is the resourcing. The thing I found quite fascinating being here there's a lot of research work that's been done that isn't published, so I had access to that. And, you know, when you, like, a, yeah, it, that would be my, uh, my biggest difference. I wanted to go to Tokyo because it was different. I wanted to compare it to the other Olympics that I've been to. And I, and I knew that, you know, I might not go to too many more Olympics um, for various reasons, but I wanted to go to this one because it, just to look at the difference, and boy, was it different. It was massively different. And because uh, I've worked in Japan for five years, I, I understood the Japanese because I've been to Olympics and World Champs, I understood the IOC and, and FISA, the international. And, and we, we had a lot of problems. So, you know, pretty much every day we were problem solving around uh, various things because uh, we lost two days of competition in the rowing. Um, we weren't at a normal recovery. I, I basically prepared the athletes for competition and recovered them post-competition. That, that was my job at, at the Olympics. And every day something happened, whether the Italians next door to us got COVID, so that happened, and then the Dutch in the, in the bay next to us, they got COVID, so that caused problems. And then just it was just the most amazing experience. And um, it, it, every day was a challenge. Every single day was a challenge. And we had to be agile and we had to be clever. Um, but one of the things that I would would add is because we prepared so well, so really well, we were forced to by the Australian system and because we were so heavily resourced, the athletes had real confidence in what we're doing and we'd practiced everything. So everything we did, nothing was new to the athletes. And I think that was my biggest difference between Australia and New Zealand. We talk about New Zealand being great with number eight wire. Yeah, that's really, really cool. But you know, for some of these people we took to the Olympics, that was their one or only chance. They'll be the only one Olympics. So you have to get everything on. So for you listening, you know, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. Even if the organization is not prepared, think about your plan A, B, and C. And if you can start trialing those and getting, getting the athletes on board with those types of things. My other difference perhaps between New Zealand and Australia, um, in their coaching team, you know, we have guys with PhDs in physiology, uh, master's degrees in physics or, you know, postgrads in physics. So typically in, in, in Australia, because there's so much money in sport, you can have a career as a coach. You know, I can go to the Olympics with 60-year-old coaches, 50-year-old coaches have done six Olympic Games. So often they won't devolve responsibility to you. You've got to persuade them about what best practices. So you change the way you operate. You don't operate in a vacuum off to the side. You, you have to be able to educate and explain to the coaches. So those are probably my unique experiences. Cool. Thanks, Brett. Uh, yeah, it sounds like uh, having a plan A, plan B, plan C is, uh, yeah, 
really important to not just at the organization level, but you know, also uh, on 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 the ground level. So uh, yeah, cool. Uh, Connor, what was your Tokyo experience like? Yeah, I guess just off the back of what Brett was saying, um, and it's kind of understated, but the the level of preparation and planning that goes into something like that. I mean, you're talking about 10,000 of the world's best athletes who poured everything that they have into basically uh, maybe a one day, a couple of days, a couple of weeks of, of performance. And so um, listening to guys like Brett, you know, Steve and Brad, all of these guys have these massive planning schedules. Every day is worked out for years and years in advance to build up to something like that. And so to be able to see them kind of that payoff when you actually get there, it's, it's something special. And it's not just the spectacle, but it's like all of the work that you've poured in for years and years. And that just as a coach, like that doesn't involve like the athletes working day in and day out, you know, wanting to spew from a training session and then, you know, you're staring down four more years of something like that every day, day in and day out. So just the, the amazing level of preparation, like it's hard to even understand um, how much work goes into something like that. And um, people on this call are some of the best to do it. I mean, obviously, the, the results kind of speak for themselves with the different teams that Brett and Steven have worked with, um, with Brad to be able to pull down the gold medal and for us a silver medal. Like, that's, that's unbelievable <laughs> how much payoff there was for all the work that went into that. And so for me to be able to jump in, like I said, I'd kind of been around the organization for two years. Um, there had been someone else in my role, Blair Mills, uh, great strength and conditioning coach to work with the sevens for years um, he um, was able to pick up another opportunity before this and so that allowed me to step into my current role um, and I guess just kind of thinking about what Brad was saying um, before is that you know the spectacle and the excitement but it's you take a step back and we'd actually been in Australia for a month before we went, we went to Tokyo. And so we'd kind of been in this like on the road every day, every hour was like scheduled. It's so like 6 a.m. wake up, get moving, 8 a.m. breakfast, 10 a.m. training, 12 p.m. or 12, you know, recovery. So every hour of the day is scheduled right up until night, whether you're calling or meeting with people or trying to figure out plans. And like Brett said, plan A, B, and C, um, all falling through at the last minute because of COVID and we were locked down in Australia. So we're really like heads down at this point after being in Aussie for a month. Um, everything's planned. We're in this routine where it's just bang, bang, bang every day. Um, and so we finally get to the village and it's kind of the same thing. Like it's, it's early mornings. It's, Steven should talk about his schedule a bit more because he was basically looking after everyone, but um, up really early all the way through all the emotional effort that goes into the actual performance the actual competition, the wind down, it's a late night, then you're back at it the next morning. So you kind of get into this routine where you're just rolling along, rolling along, rolling along. And then you do have these moments though, where you just take a breath and it's like, whoa, like I'm actually here. Like I'm actually at the Olympic games. And like Brad was saying, like for me, a moment came like I, I follow NBA basketball. So I'm just going to lunch. I have like a 20 minute window before we're training. And so I'm, I'm actually running to lunch to make it on time right and like so everything's happening quickly but I'm riding the escalator up to where the food hall is and I see Yao Ming like going down the other side like oh yeah that's cool <laughs> I get to the top of the the top of the escalator I turn right and then it's the Gasol brothers Mark and Pau Gasol like right at the top like they're heading down it's like whoa those are the Gasol brothers and I have a seat and I think it's Jason Tatum's on the other side of the table along with Luka Doncic and it's like these guys I just passed like almost a billion dollars worth of like NBA salary money walking into lunch. Like, this is amazing. What's going on here? Pinch me. I don't think this is real. <laughs> so you just see like the wide range of people and like, you know, those just the, the NBA practice probably just got over, right? Like it's not actually that big of a deal in that context, but you take a breath and you open your eyes around what's going on. Like, Oh yeah, there's Val Adams. She's having a salad for lunch. That's pretty cool. Like you just super, routine but it's also incredible just the the humans that you cross paths with so that was kind of just my eye opening kind of take a breath moment during the games it was really special and obviously like winning a medal was amazing um and we took silver and I think that was um one of the most unique experiences of my life I'm sitting there we see our our athletes up on the podium 
Um, Argentina's just won bronze. They are excited. They're singing, they're dancing, they've just won bronze. Fijians are on top, they, wear, they have gold medals around their neck. They're singing, they're dancing. And then you look at our guys and it's this real somber, like kind of humble mood. And it was just such a wild, like depth of the different kind of reactions that can go on at the Olympic Games, like such a wide range of everything that you could imagine, such like humble defeat, the agony, the, the excitement and the thrill of the victory all in one scene. Um, those are were, those were special. And obviously we wanted to win gold, but um, to be able to experience that was pretty amazing. Thanks, Connor. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it must just be so surreal at, at times, and yeah, being being a part of experiencing um, those emotions alongside those people that you form those relationships with, uh, really special. And I did want to just cycle back to something. I think you'd all sort of um, mentioned around. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give say thank you from us if, because there's a lot of sacrifice. You talked about the early mornings and the training and all of the all of the uh, effort that uh, you guys uh, spend. You you guys are the team behind the team. Uh, yeah, just wanted to say, obviously, we're really proud of you guys. Um, yeah, wanted to say that we really appreciate the, the work you do. I mean, Brett's, he's still not able to keep, get back into the country and see his family and friends. So, you know, the time you spend away from those people that are, are close and dear to you, um, yeah, just want to say a big thanks from us. Uh, final sort of uh, question there is just, uh, I think we'll start with you, Steve. Uh, can you just sort of talk about a little bit, uh, hopefully something positive about uh, something uh, that the you know, the relationship with the uh, university has been uh, beneficial to you? Something positive, you reckon, Marty? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've get, yeah. I, I did give you the, these questions in advance, so hopefully you've been able to come up with something. Yeah, like his supervisor is pretty cool, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I mean. My role, I suppose, been has been pretty deeply involved in, in both camps. I suppose being um, PhD with the um, at, at University of Waikato at Adam Centre there. So yeah, look, it has been it has been great. I think it's like working across, like to touch on the Adam Centre. I suppose it's massively unique to be able to do well, not massively unique. Like it happens a lot, I guess, in Aussie with uh, AIS and things, but it's. I think in New Zealand to be able to do a PhD or research project in a in a place like Mount Monganui um, at the Adam Centre was pretty unique for New Zealand and and that really suited me as a person to to be able to like I think I've only been to the university once the University of Waikato in Hamilton um, and you know so to be able to do a PhD in a non traditional sense and not really be at a university and, and, and in that kind of routine uh, it's been pretty great it obviously has its challenges with um uh i suppose different access to different things but um the the center over there is a really cool little spot and it's got great facilities for the things that we do uh with the environmental chamber and a little lab there and um really good recovery space out the back and and excellent um strength training facility so yeah i'd say that'd be the, the 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 biggest positive i could say and then and working with you guys as well marty and um in particular and and, and kim alongside um always willing to to support i suppose to shout out to marty he, he was never really meant to be uh on my project to, to start with i suppose and then um six months in we realized that um we're a bit short on the ground in terms of people that could actually help uh, in a day-to-day -day sense. So, yeah, massive shout out to you, Marty, for for jumping on and lending your expertise. Obviously, you've been around rugby and um, and sport and academia, and so understand each side of it. So, um, I've still got a little bit to go. So, hopefully, you can help out on that as well. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, shout out to to you guys there as well, the Adams. Um, oh, and probably on the back end of it as well. I think doing, um, being involved in a, in that kind of place and and having other students like Connor and we had a guy Frank from Italy um, and Ivana. Um, it was a, a really cool crew that we kind of had there. To, um, we were all doing different projects with different kind of teams, but it was cool to share that experience with. Um, kind of people from all around the world you know that, that were on a similar path so 
yeah, it's been pretty special. Cool. Move to you. Yeah, thanks, Ozzy. It's Steve. Really appreciate it. Um, Brett. Yeah, um, a massive, massive for me um, at, at a whole lot of levels. Um, firstly, as an academic staff, uh, I'm tenured academic staff. I, I was able to pick up contracts from the moment I started and and to work in an applied sense. The university saw the value of allowing me not just to be an academic publishing, so sort of working, teaching and doing theoretical research, but also be able to work um, in consultancy. So, um, uh, I mean, they made a bit of money out of it, which helped as well too, but I, I just, I just can't thank the university enough for allowing me the opportunity to do the things that I did. Um, I was embedded in the Museum Rowing program for over a decade while also working as an academia, academic. The second side is, is that a lot of the things that I have done that I've introduced into the various sports that I've been involved with is on the back of science. And, and I've not always done the science myself. So I've had a number of postgrad students that I've, uh, who, who've worked collaboratively through other universities or through Waikato University that have had a major impact and the innovations that I use that have given me the opportunity to work all around the world in rugby and, and, and in a multiple uh, international rowing programs. Um, so, you know, um, again, I just can't thank the university enough for that as well. So for me personally, um, you know, the, the University of Waikato is, you know, the reason I'm, I'm here basically is doing what I'm doing. So I can't thank them enough. Thanks, Brett. Uh, uh, Connor. Yeah, so one of the big draws for me coming to New Zealand to do a, a PhD in the first place was the um, international reputation that this part of the world carries along with it. And I think that I've talked to people, students in the community or just um, other sports kind of practitioners, and it's almost this kind of idea that people don't actually know how good it is down here. Um, it's like you tell people like, oh, yeah, like New Zealand, Australia, like these two countries known around the world for their innovation and and partly in, in, uh, thanks to work from people like Brad and, and other people within different universities here. So the reputation is what brought me down here. And then it delivers because immediately you get to be able to be immersed in environments like the high performance center here. And. In, in the mount and um, you get the opportunity to actually do research that matters in an applied sense. So Brett mentioned kind of the theoretical side, but um, you look at, like for me, I was looking at other opportunities back in the US and, and uh, in different countries. And it involves like years and years of coursework before you're even standing in front of an athlete. Um, but from here, from my experience with this program at the University of Waikato, it was day one. Um, had opportunities to to apply my trade as a strength and conditioning coach and then also um, work to then be innovative and bring the science side that will help push the entire industry forward. And that's where it's going. Um, you know, five, 10 years ago, a master's degree was like pretty cutting edge stuff. Like no one, no one had a master's degree even, you know, before then maybe, but just within the last 10 years. And now it's the field is accelerating. Things are being discovered, new things are being challenged and approached in exciting ways. And so this university is part of that process and, and, and what's going on in the industry as a whole. And so being a part of that process has been pretty special and it's allowed me to grow as a practitioner and uh, get my feet into the academia kind of science side, which is pretty cool too. Oh, thanks, Connor. And Brad. Best for last. Well, I don't really talk around uh, my relationship with, with like I said, you know, I'm an AUT graduate. Um, but then if I, if I look at my, the crew of support people that I had around us, and, and I, I probably don't speak about it enough, but Brett's our sports scientist. You know, he's had a huge impact on our team over the last sort of 18 months. And then not only our team and our athletes, but my learning as well. And so, again, I've been a rugby for 13 years, but the amount of learning that's happened and just for me professionally over the last 18 months because of Brett's direct input has been huge. Um, Stephen was our, obviously our, a PhD, PhD student initially, but then you know, he, he was a huge part of our, our heat strategy or our heat acclimation 
prior to going to the Olympics. And we trialed a number of things, um, which Stephen was a huge part of. Some of it good, some of it bad, but like, we trialed everything. And we were, like you said, there was plans A, B, C, and D, but you know, we, we had ruled out a number of options that weren't going to be useful thanks to, thanks to Stephen's input. And he, and, and him and Marty um, put in a huge shift during those trials. Uh, you know, you got 21 contracted athletes, you are trying a number of strategies in the uh, environmental chamber, and it just doesn't happen without I mean, manpower on the ground, being able to run heart rate, you know, take lactate measures, et cetera, et cetera, and actually run the actual protocols itself. So that probably wasn't my role, um, but having that support on the ground allowed me then to just continue our, our rugby development with our coaches because Stephen and, and Marty were in the chamber pretty much losing 10 kgs a day. <laughs> Any more and Marty would have faded away. Um, and, then, and then obviously, last but not least, like Connor, um, mate, been in our program only for a couple of years now, but again, the amount of learning that I've, I've had from you as a, as a practitioner. So again, been doing it for 13 years. I you know, thought I was pretty comfortable in my own skin and then you come along and you know, bring up all the blind spots that, that I have <clears throat> in terms of strength and power. You know, so the impact you've had on our girls and, and when, you, when you put it all together in terms of the three lads that helped us directly from Moika to Guinea, you, know, you can be pretty proud that our Olympic gold medal with the women's program was largely influenced by the three boys that have you know, have come from their white castle uni background. So just a just a just a huge thank you from from me and, and our support staff and our athletes and our management to, to you and White Castle Uni for your support. I suppose over the course of the last not in the last couple of years, but the last five years since I've been involved. Um, and to any of the you know students that are thinking about doing a PhD, like you said, the Adam Center itself. So you got men's and women's sevens, you've got Bay of Plenty Rugby, you've got David Nika, the boxer, who's, who's sort of popping across every now and then. you got our sprint cyclists coming across from Cambridge. You've got our, our rowing crew coming in across to use the chamber. So, you know, like Connor said, in terms of getting in front of athletes, you know, you've got multiple, multiple gold medalists and, and Olympic medalists coming to this facility to use it on a, on a, on a regular basis. You know, so it's, it's, it's highly motivating um, to want to be in this region, no, not only for that and you just got the mount as well. So uh, I just again thanks to thanks to you boys that are on the call and obviously Kim and Marty just for your continued support over the last few years. So hopefully we can um continue that relationship and, and, and formalize it a bit more moving forward. Um, because if, if we learn anything, Paris will be even harder, you know, and leave oh, no stone unturned, I suppose. And Japan opened our eyes, I think, to to what's possible or, or what's actually required to actually be successful again uh, again uh, in a few years yeah absolutely yeah well thanks everybody for that um i don't know about you guys but i've i've learned a lot in the last you know 45 50 minutes as well um you know it sounds like a university was a help in, in knowledge generation and and that you know um applied applied sports science setting and uh, we're often considered the the people in the back rooms and in the scary lab in the back but you know we we're just happy if we can contribute and, and help out so um yeah big thanks to you guys as well like I said your for your expertise and your uh, and your sacrifices you know and thanks heaps for coming on today we do really appreciate um having a bit of a chat yeah uh, yeah so on behalf of the yeah university of Waikato thank you very much and uh yeah keep up the the good work <laughs> <laughs>